If you poke around on the refurb circuit nowadays, the cheapest tower that you'll find is a sub-$100 Core 2 Duo from the Conroe era. Similar to what's in the Silver Bullet these days. Nerd up, nerd up, nerd up! Woo 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 woo! The Wacky World of Multimedia J! So I finally had a chance to test out all these spare drives that have been sitting around from old arrays, the original mechanical drive that came with laptops that got swapped out with an SSD, the works. I wound up with three exact 250 gigs as well from an old array plus the Dellasaurus. Interestingly enough though, the older drives in the array actually had a faster maximum transfer rate than the one from the Dellasaurus did. So these are still mechanical drives, they're nothing that exciting. We're talking 100 to 150 megs a second tops. Most SSDs can smoke that. But the interesting part is that the laptop drives, even at 5400 RPMs, could still float around the 100 meg per second max transfer amount. So here's what I'm looking to do. These three will go into the Silver Bullets drive cage, the spare cage, and then these three, when I get brackets for them, will go into Tuxedo to help cut down the power consumption in that respect. These two are archaic and obsolete. This thing had a maximum transfer of 60 megs a second. This one had a maximum transfer of 30 megs a second. So it just goes to show how far technology has gone since the mid to late 2000s, because these are the two oldest drives here. They're horrible. I mean, you could get a thumbstick that's better than this. But it just goes to show how technology can silently age on us. Done. It may be a rat's nest, but it is what it is. And I don't use this system for anything too serious anymore as I'm trying to burn out the Core 2 Duo once and for all. Even still has the Vantex Stealths from when the original Silver Bullet was in here and it was an Athlon XP 2000. But this is still a Conroe era Core 2 Duo from back when Intel stole the crown from AMD and it's been that way ever since. Got the three drives in to have 750 gigs of space for game installs, which might even be overkill for this machine. And speaking of overkill, I'm borrowing the graphics card from the Delosaurus just to bottleneck the heck out of this thing. This thing only gets 240 on a CPU test on NovaBench. I don't expect much from it. I bet even this is embellishing things a bit too much. But let's see just how bottlenecked this really is. Well folks, the joke is on me. It looks like, apparently, the answer is not very bottlenecked at all when you go all the way the heck back to a Core 2 Duo. Mostly because of new technologies that have become mainstream since the Core 2 Duo's heyday, like SSDs for example. I do notice some lag with, say, some system tasks or tasks that would normally grind up the drives on an old mechanical drive system. I will notice now, because that's no longer the bottleneck, now it's the processor. So you see 99% CPU usage instead of 99% disk usage in Windows Task Manager. But in the case of everyday tasks and light computing like basic desktop tasks, I could imagine a Core 2 Duo with an SSD being used to crunch spreadsheets in a business. Just not anything that requires a ton of CPU, like for example crunching video would probably be noticeably slow. Also, multitasking takes a massive hit when you drop back to two cores. I mean, I'm getting a stuttering mouse cursor just from copying the crew over the network. <laughs> I'm copying it from Steam install to Steam install, but my mouse cursor is still lagging and stuttering. So that's really what we've gained by newer processors and more processing speed, is basically the ability to do more at once. So yeah, it's usable, but it's not optimal. You could probably get away with playing some games on this kind of a setup where the processor is royally spoiled by a graphics card that's way too good for it up to a certain point until you hit something like, say, a quad-core block where a game wouldn't run if you didn't have quad-core, something along those lines. Ah, now we're slowing down. Well, the whole system's slowing down and stuttering now, so I'm just trying to click the window and, oh, can I click something else? Yeah, I can, I suppose. But because this is a non-activated Windows 10 install, I only have the stock set up, no customization allowed. And I'm starting to miss some of my customizations already, but... It's kind of interesting how Microsoft is basically doing like old school internet shareware where you can get a basic Windows environment, but if you want to actually do anything like customizable or something like that, then you have to buy a license. Also, there's watermarks that appear from time to time saying, Hey, activate Windows, you idiot! Well, not in those exact words, but we all know what the story is with that, so this is just a test system. I'm not really planning on doing anything serious with this ever again, and I could nuke everything and go back to Linux at any point. 
And there's an example of what I'm talking about here. High CPU usage, and all we're doing is copying over a file. That's because the disk is no longer the bottleneck. Back in the days of mechanical drives, you would have 100% disk usage, and maybe the processor would, wouldn't be, yeah. Grind, grind, grind. So basically, the torch has been passed. And uh, actually, this is going, oh, this is going to a mechanical drive. It's not even going to the SSD. This would be more pronounced if we were going to the SSD or something like that. But you get that, too, with a ton of, you know, data being moved. The processor goes nutso, but the disk doesn't use up all its bandwidth. So, But even copying over the network to a mechanical drive, we have sizable amounts of processor here just to copy over the crew. And it's all done now, so it's going to go back down. But that's what you lose when you go back to a processor that had its heyday during the heydays of Windows Vista. Here's another great example. All I'm doing is discovering existing files for the crew, which is basically, it's discovering what I just copied down, and we have 38% of the processor in use because of Steam. Uh, so yeah, this is what a weak CPU gets you, and it really is a matter of, the thing is, Windows game mode has come out since the last time I did any kind of testing like this, so... Yeah, this is going to shake things up quite a bit, because Windows Game Mode is supposed to improve minimum FPS on older, slower machines. There is one thing worth noting. I have some prettier looking benchmarks, like the Heavensward benchmark and the Unigen benchmarks, but we're not actually going to include them in this video. I suppose what I should do is probably announce that I've decided to bring back Chillin' It Jay's Geek House, specifically for showdowns between pretty looking benchmarks or something else, and some of the hardware combinations that I have these days. It was a, it was a series that really lacked some concentrated coolness for the longest time, but I think the whole relaxing type theme and whatnot of relaxing on the couch and checking out some benchmarks and stuff might be worth a few uploads. If it doesn't work, then I'll just fold the series again, but we're not going to be doing anything too pretty here. We're going to do some basic benchmarks and mess around in the crew, and we'll save some of the other stuff for later and try chilling at Jay's Geek House with things like the Final Fantasy benchmark and the Unigen benchmarks, of which Superposition has now come out. So we gotta go around the circuit and try it on the various machines and whatnot to see how everything is handled and whatnot, with, especially with Monolith and whatnot, because Superposition should be the benchmark that makes Monolith not run, you know, that Monolith can't run maxed out with its 1060. So yeah, what are we up to? Almost 40% CPU, so a little about a third and change of the processor just to check files. That's the price you pay when you try and make a Core 2 Duo still seem relevant in today's day and age. Sound change, busting out the digital camera of course, because most of what we have left involves filming screens, so let's bust out the camera that's better at that sort of thing without getting roll of vision everywhere. With the recent announcement of Chillin' at Jay's Geek House returning and whatnot, we'll save the more graphically intense benchmarks for those, and just take care of the basic ones, like Nova Bench, for example. 11, 11, 11, 10, almost up to what Tuxedo can do, interestingly enough, despite a much weaker processor. Believe me, it was quite a leap going from this Core 2 Duo to the Phenom 1090T, or Phenom 2 1090T. 734. That's right in line with what I've seen from this last go-around. We had Windows 8 consumer preview, but again, around 240 for the processor, and of course, even with a graphics card as far ahead in years, it's of course getting held back, and it's 300-something. All right, let's do the boat test now. See what this thing does for boat tests nowadays. Yay, some animation! And, but the thing is though, with how long it took just to get to the graphics tests, I can tell that we're on a, definitely on a slower processor. It cannot multitask like its successors can, that's for sure. Ay, ay, ay. Well, the graphics tests seem to be turning out okay, but these are synthetic benchmarks. They don't really represent real-world conditions. I'm actually curious what happens when we start throwing some games at this kind of setup. But at least, you know, this looks okay, I suppose. Surfboard, raft, tree trunk. There's our answer. You can't bail out a terrible processor with a modern graphics card. Period. Oh man, this is rubbish! <laughs> Can you hear it? Can you hear it? <coughs> That's the Core 2 Duo choking on the crew <laughs> at 20 frames per second with stutter galore. 
Although I am kind of doing, you know, a little bit of a nod to the hardware generation here that this was a rival to console-wise by playing it with a 360 controller on this machine. Ay, ay, ay. Let's see, what do we have for settings? Probably the settings from Monolith, aka way too high. Oh no, 1080p, oh, it's a 1080 30. I'm gonna turn it up to 1080 60 and watch it not make a difference. <laughs> The game has now switched from day to night for some strange reason. And we've switched from 1080p normal to 1080p low mode, and it's not making a difference. Not even hitting 30 frames per second. <laughs> and this is in a city. It would be worse in the forests of the south. Let's try 720p. 720p low mode. We can somewhat approach 30 frames a second, but it's still in the 20s. Yep, like I said, you can't bail out. <laughs> this is like a Nintendo 64 game now. Actually, you know what would make it more like a Nintendo 64 game? What's the lowest widescreen resolution that we can have on here? Oh, that was it. Um, let's see, how about 1176 by 664? <laughs> Oh, there we go. By dropping the resolution all the way the heck down, we can maybe hit 30 frames a second. I got news for you. This game resembles Cruising USA on N64 a lot more than it resembles the crew. <laughs> it is interesting playing this with a 360 controller again. I may have to swap controllers on the main system, Monolith, and play it with a 360 controller. I just got too spoiled by the Xbox One controller's triggers. Now, here's the fun part. You want to know where it's going to be a total slideshow? Let's go down to the forests in Florida. Yeah, I don't care what Green Hand says. The day of the Core 2 Duo is over. Likewise, the day of the Dual Core processor actually being competent for gaming is over. Even those Pentiums with the hyper-threading, I mean... Uh-oh! Uh -oh. <laughs> We're heading towards a crash now! Single digits, baby! <laughs> oh, man. Oh, now we've done it. Game over. Epic fail. Well, like I said, the Core 2 Duo's days are over, as is dual cores, and once the Ryzen processors become more mature products, then, uh, yeah, we're going... <laughs> Or maybe that was a background task. By the way, this terrible performance is with game mode turned on, by the way. I wonder why I'm doing this in camcorder let's play mode. Uh, oops, river. Oh, and it takes time to splash into the river, too. <laughs> what is it, loading stuff off the... No, it can be loading stuff off the drive. It's just that processor at 100% and 54 degrees is completely and totally slammed. Oh, man, look at that. The, 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 the frame rate went down when I drove back on the tar. <laughs> oh man, this poor thing. And look at the GPU up top. It's sitting there yawning because the processor can't get information to it fast enough. This is what CPU bottlenecking looks like. And this is why, if you're going to get a computer from this generation because you're like, oh, let's see what I can squeeze out of a cheap refurb, at least get the Core 2 Quad, like the Q6600 or something. So so it can actually be Dukes of Hazard. I ain't. At least get the Core 2 Quad Q6600 so it can at least be quad core in some way, shape, or form. Not this stuff. <laughs> wow, this is bad. Let me tell you. 20 frames a second, and if it has to load something, it's all over. Now, can you imagine trying to Twitch stream with a horrible setup like this? Not to mention, the graphics are so low. Minimum, uh, you know, minimum uh, screen size, minimum screen size, and everything turned off, low mode. It actually is starting to look kind of like a PlayStation 1 game with all the jaggies everywhere. Now, this is the part where somebody's gonna be like, well, if you CPU limit it, just jack everything all the way up. Okay, let's go back to 1080p while we're in Florida. 1080p low mode in the Florida forests where you get the lowest frame rates in the game. Now everything looks a little sharper, but let's head back towards those forests. 
Well, if 20 frames a second is something you don't mind playing with. <laughs> Actually, this is a perfect side of being CPU limited right here because we increase the... Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Epic fail. End of the line. <laughs> Load times. This is like Morrowind on a slow computer back in the day gone wrong. Oh boy, oh boy. What are we doing here? Uh, 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 hey! <laughs> now that's what I call stutter. I'm surprised we haven't had anything blue screen yet. <laughs> so yeah, this is what CPU limiting looks like. Complete and utter rubbish for performance. I'll bet even a Q6600 wouldn't improve things that much for a newer game like this. Uh, yeah. Right. The Q6600 is one of the processors that I'm curious about, though. But this is just awful. And it's better material for chilling at Jay's Geek House. So that ends our test right here. I have lagged this thing out long enough, and I've stared at that 100% processor and 0% GPU long enough. That's it. Mercy rule. Mercy rule. This nonsense has gone on long enough. And we've tortured this thing long enough. So there is your answer, folks, on whether or not you can get the cheapest sub $100 Core 2 Duo, pair it up with a decent graphics card, and get some games going. It depends on what games. There's not a doubt in my mind that this machine would fly all over games from the previous generation, like if you hadn't played some Xbox 360 classics that were ported over to PC. But don't think you're gonna get into PC gaming and have the graphics cards save your sorry ass. <laughs> graphics cards need multitasking capability and some number crunching capability backing them up. Otherwise, you end up with a situation like this. Until next time, this is Multimedia J, signing off. Thanks for stopping by.